Hello class, let's start with chapter eight, early medieval and Romanesque architecture. So this is a quick timeline. The empire is beginning to end and it's really the fall of the Roman empire. But as we, we constantly see there's this constant struggle of power, the Islam is growing and to take power, which is Charlemagne. So Charlemagne comes from this lineage of his Father, his grandfather, really taking over the region of which is called the Franks. So it's uh, Germany, France, and and all this region. And eventually, Charlemagne uh, uh, takes control, and, and he kind of consolidates a lot of Europe. Uh, so, but something that's very important to know about him is that he is a Christian, and so. Uh, but I don't. So he he's he's a believer uh, of Christianity. And but and he takes it to a whole uh, a new level of really really wanting everyone to be uh, um, become a Christian. So everything starts with Charlemagne. The reason we I want to start with a little bit history of him is because every, everything started with this new era, this new uh, style. Uh, really, really begins with him. So it becomes a big, important time. So this era of time is, is usually called Carolinian, so it kind of comes from the combination of his names so with Charlemagne or Charles the Great, Carlos the Grande, or Car Carlos Magnus. And so Carol, you see all this combination, you, you get Carolinian, uh, or also Romanesque. And when we, when, when we say Romanesque, uh, I want you to, you know, think that it's it means... Uh, and it just means like Roman, like the Romans, or in the manner of the Romans. But uh, some people get confused and they say, oh, that looks, that's very Romanesque. But Romanesque is not so much that it looks like the Roman, like it's not that it looks like the Romans, it's it's more about the time period. It's about this, during this, this time period of uh, architecture, uh, through Char uh, under Charlemagne's rule, so it's so don't use it just like oh you know that wall is Romanesque or that chair is Romanesque. And it could be used to that extent. It might be it might be understood, but in reality, it's more about the timeline or a specific time. So everything starts with Charles the Great, Charlemagne, and Charlemagne again. He's a believer, and there comes this moment. And where Charlemagne, he he comes to the Pope, goes to the Pope Leo, and 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 it, the story goes that it's on Christmas, and again trying to make it this very 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 religious event, the Christmas night, which is the night that they believe that you know Jesus was born, the Savior was born, and so on that day, on the year at 800, uh, Charlemagne gets crowned Emperor of of uh, Rome, of Europe, and he's called Pater Europa, which means the father of Europe, because in a way he unites most of the Western Europe for the first time since, since the Roman Empire, uh, has, uh, so the Western Empire fell, and he, this is the first time that it's again united, and 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 his rule really spurred, as mentioned, this Renaissance, this Carolinian Renaissance, a period of energetic, cultural, and intellectual activity we, we, uh, during this and this. So we see Carolinian or, or Charles Charlemagne uh, really take power, really, really take this role as he kind of calls himself the new Roman emperor. He, he labels himself the Roman emperor. So you see he has a lot of connection with the Roman. He, he sort of it feels like he is the new emperor, he, and so he tries to elude a lot of his work and all of his architecture and sort of building back the empire because now he is the new emperor. Here's a, a quick map of you know the, all the different regions that is growing. We talked about Germany, France, uh, Austria, and all these places that are slowly been getting to get conquered. Uh, one of the things that is uh, important to know is that so Charlemagne is a believer he is a Christian but not, not only that he wants everyone to become a Christian so he does go on this sort of uh, process or journey of, of really trying to convert everyone that he's conquering and it's either they convert or they die so that's that's one of the one of the many stories 
uh, and tells of, of him killing hundreds and hundreds of people for not converting. So one of the ways that he tries to convert people is through uh, violence in a way. Uh, but the second way that he does it is through education. It, it's, so he really wants to educate people to become uh, into the Christian kingdom. So, uh, but one of the big problems is in order to be educated, you be, need to be able to know how to read and know how to write. And so during this time, there was not a lot of people who knew how to do that. So, so Charlemagne, what he does is he sort of creates not not a school, but a selective group, which eventually become monks. And, and these people are uh, they become study. They they really start developing new technologies. And but the, the, one of the big things is these monks are devoted to God. They sort of leave everything behind. So they leave the world and they just go into into you know. Uh, living this life of, of, of devotion to God, of, of, of really connecting to God, and not only connecting to God, but teaching others about, about um, Christianity. So that becomes a very, very, very big thing uh, during this time. And so one of the big problems was language. So uh, Latin was sort of the classical, but from Latin came Spanish, Italian, French, and all these different languages. And Charlemagne, again, was trying to consolidate it, was trying to make this one the unification of this Western empire. And um, so one of the ways he's tries doing that is, again, education, teaching this monk to selective groups, um, and also creating or having this group of scribes, people that would that would write these in parchment and it's a really, really difficult process, but they were basically just transcribing uh, the, all the scriptures that they had and so that so that uh, as they build churches, as they build new basilicas, they would have the word with them. And so here you see this guy, this this sort of mosaic of of um, of a scribe uh, working and, and writing uh, some of these um, scripture, and you see, I think it's a pretty funny uh, image because you kind of see that he looks a bit, you know, frustrated or annoyed or you know, I don't know. He's just, he's just tired. This guy's tired, and 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 there's this phrase that I'm not sure if it's resembled this this specific image, but it's this image of, of someone writing that says, the art of the scribe is the hardest of the arts. It is difficult, it's, it is difficult toil. It is hard to bend the neck and plow through the pages for three hours. Three fingers write, but the whole body tolls. Just as it is sweet for the sailor to reach the harbor, so it is sweet for the writer to put the final letter on the page. So you can see that these people were like really, 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 pushed to the limit, and they, they sort of said that they would write like seven pages a day, which seems like not a lot, but it, the writing in, the, in those times was very, very, very difficult. And here you see some, um, the, the way that was canonized, the original one, and you see that it's a little bit hard to understand to a certain extent, you know, not a lot of uh, differentiation, but capital and lowercase, there's no punctuations, everything is like one big long sentence. So so Charlemagne during this time, he really, really tries to create, uh, make the process faster of, of being able to create uh, these this writings for everyone. So so he starts they start working and creating new new types of writing. So one of the, the which kind of leads to the Carolinian minuscule. You start seeing how now it starts to look a bit more, um, more simplistic and more easy to understand the punctuation. One of the things that comes out from this, which I think is very, very interesting, now you can tell people that you know this, is that the, the, the question mark, uh, it is said that it comes through this period. It's not used as much, but eventually, but it, it does find its origin in this era. Again, because of the Carolinian pushing for education, pushing for writing, pushing for the arts, pushing for, for, for to grow. And so that's why many call it this time of, of renaissance. This is just like a funny thing. 
uh, if you, in case you can read it, I'm missing an eye. So in the beginning, there was no punctuation, blah, blah, blah. So there's all these, you know, sort of imagining reading something like this. And this is sort of how it was before uh, Carolinian time. Everything started to really become more simplistic so it can be faster. Uh, on the right, you see an, an image of an equestrian statue. Equestrian just means, uh, you know, the act of, you know, riding a horse. And, and so this is a very, very, very common uh, idea, very common uh, pose that they do sort of as a sign of power, as a sign of triumph. And, and, and again, we're talking about Romanesque. So Carolina, he's, Charlemagne, I'm sorry, he's calling himself the new emperor. So he, he's basically trying to replicate or do a lot of what the Roman Empire did. As you can tell, it's, this is 180 AD, and now it's 880. So, so a long time has passed uh, uh, by. And, and so, but, but, but Charlemagne, he's sort of still trying to imitate him in, in a way. What, is, what I think is really, really interesting, and one of the reasons why I brought this image here, is because you see this, uh, this sort of statue, and, and honestly, if I would have told you that this was older than this one, you would have believed it probably, because this one looks a lot more modern or a lot more sophisticated than this one. So during the Romanesque Carolinian period, it, the statues and the artwork becomes very stiff sort of Egyptian-like, sort of, you know, very lifeless. Here you can see the movement, you can see the, the power, you can see the drapery, you can almost feel the horse just uh, lifting up and, and feeling the strength on the calves and, and seeing that it's about to get into action versus this, uh, this uh, Charlemagne just seems, you know, kind of childish, pretty plain, a little bit boring. A little bit of movement here, but honestly, not too exciting. But during this time, it, everything becomes very, very more stiff, more, 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 uh, more linear, because they were trying to really, really connect to the spiritual and not so much to to the the humanistic. So everything throughout this time is a period where they're trying to say, basically, uh, that they wanted you know to be more humble care more about the spiritual, not so much, you know, about uh, um, money and, and all these things. And that's sort of a pattern that you'll see a bit more throughout the thing. So I want you to already start seeing. Uh, before we start with Charlemagne and all of his world, uh, I wanted to go to Norway. Uh, so this is sort of like a, a little quick pause, uh, you know, before we start. Uh, because... Um, Again, the, the rise of Christianity is, is spreading, and it's spreading in other places, such as in Norway. The other places we'll see that they all look very much similar, but this one is a bit more different. Uh, so, so this is called Viking architecture. So, in Norway, you know, what what do they? You sort of what I like about this one. We go back to this image. It sort of seems like it's it, Norway's a very, very more open space. It's a lot more nature and, and trees and, and the, the great outdoors. So it almost seems as as if nature is sort of, um, it's, it's sort of building it. Like it sort of just seems like it grew naturally from the ground and, and it's sort of just, you know, part of the nature itself. So that's, uh, that's something that uh, it's, it's very important to, to, to see that. Uh, and not only that, but I, I like it because, you know, the uh, Romanesque architecture is usually not for masonry, very, very strong. It feels very, very heavy, but this one feels a bit lighter again. It feels like it's just sort of flowing part of nature. And it's a lot more focused on wood. Wood, it's it's not the what is used the most during this period because they are going more into masonry because why? Um, they're trying to protect it from the fire. So they really want to build something that's going to last. And usually when you work with wood, it's either going to, you know, uh, probably risk of burning down or, or slowly decaying with time through weathering. 
So this is some uh, examples. You see, you start seeing very, very big differences. One of the big differences, instead of having a big, major triumphal arch entrance, you get this really uh, small entrance, this sort of just window, like this sort of small eye into that, into this place. So that's, that's one of the big differences. You're still getting this axial kind of way, and you also feel you get this procession feeling more, more private to public. But at the same time, there's a lot, lot more, more. Uh, I like this one in the in the this image of is the story of originally it was a story of Ragnarok, and the story of Ragnarok is maybe you've seen the movie of Thor, and, and this is this part of the Greek sorry from their. Um, Noric mythology, where you know it's sort of the end of days, and um, and so the Christians they 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 connected that uh, their story to the judgment day, to sort of the last day for of the day of, of, of the, the judgment that God comes. And so what I found really 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 interesting about this, and I just wanted you to see this, is that architecture uh, throughout the times. Uh, as people go, you know, this is something that becomes very recurrent, that they use images that they, they're they most likely familiar with in order for them to associate it easier. So they're, they're used to this imagery, and now they now they explain Judgment Day is something like, okay, yeah, we've seen that. It's sort of, it's sort of like saying, oh, yeah, it's like Ragnarok. Yeah, but it's, but this is, not Ragnarok, you know. So it's it's, it's so uh, it's something that happens very very recurrently throughout uh, architecture, where they use um, symbols or imagery that is very cultural, but appropriated for something that they want to show them. The last image regarding state architectures. This is called state architecture. The reason we're calling it state architecture is because of this. Um, vertical planks, vertical uh, a member that is, you know, this wood piece that is sort of creating the whole framework, creating the shell of these of these churches. And so uh, so that's why it's called the state church. Again, everything is made out of wood, this amazing wood structure. And I, I really, really like that it, like this, this sort of section, you see this uh, uh, bracing, you know, and even though it's, um, it's going to be covered. It looks very, very, very uh, beautiful. So everything is the, the, the workmanship of, of, the, of these people is really, really, really amazing. So uh, it's important that you know these. I'm not going to go over all of these parts, but the, this part is going to be in the, in, the, in, the, in the final exam. So it's important that you know these different areas. Most importantly, the state, but again, all of the other ones as well are important. So now let's go back to... Uh, what we were talking about in um, more in the in the western part, and so so so, so Charlemagne he builds a palace called Akan. So the palace of Akan, and again, always start thinking this is Romanesque. So it's trying to is in the Roman manner is connecting to the Roman. What Roman building might might have influenced this? And so you see this. So what do you think? What is this? Uh, what does this round plan resemble? What does this plan remind you of? And, and hopefully it reminds me of something because this is sort of what uh, the class has been about and hopefully you're remembering things. Uh, but what does this atrium into a circle plan, atrium, this courtyard sort of uh, reminding you of? And so hopefully you said San Vitale Ravena. And San Vital Ravenna, or even the, Mus the mausoleum of the Santa Constanza, and you see this this central plan, and I've I've talked about this several times. Central plan, is a circle, uh, which everything sort of revolves around it. Talked about it even as like an onion type, and, and the same thing with San Vital Ravenna. You see this this circle. I have this ambulatory, this aisles that you can just walk around, and that's sort of what's happening here once again, bringing back ideas from the uh, Byzantium, from the Roman Empire, and just appropriating it and making them zone. And another possible thing that he probably referenced was the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which again, you see the circle plan with an open courtyard, and again, you see that here, circle plan with an open courtyard. So we start seeing how there's some 
this is the beginning, there's an early resemblance to the Roman architecture. So this is the Palatine Chapel, which is the one we, we just, we were seeing right now, this is this one. And so now let's see it from the interior and you start seeing, you know, uh, Romanesque architecture becomes very, 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 very blocky, like very heavy. It feels almost, um, you know, made out of Legos or made out of something, you know. Here you start seeing, uh, if you get just shapes, it just feels like it's very blocky, like square, 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 rectangle. And because it's all, you know, made out of this very, very, very heavy material. And, and not only that, but there's not a light coming in. Basically, they built the whole thing and then they make little holes for light at the top. That's sort of the the, the idea of it. Another, you know, talking about the Roman influence, what is this one? What do you think was the reference for, for this one? What do you think uh, that they were trying to reference? And I don't think you might have guessed correctly because this was a bit a bit too far of a stretch, but it's 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 actually under the arch of the Constantine. So this this um, this gatehouse is the oldest example, the oldest uh, living example of the the Romanists during this period architecture and, and it's resembling the, the Arc of Triumph. And the way it's resembling is how many arches do you see? One, two, three. So this was, uh, uh, so what they took from this was not so much the literal sense, but so much the symbolic, so the, so more of the spiritual idea. And so, so the number three, we get the idea of three, we, we talked about three was this idea of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so the number three becomes very, very important for them. So they, they start doing this sort of arc, uh, triumph arch, not so much literally, but more symbolically. And so that's something that's very, very important. I want you to when think about Romanesque, not as literal translations, but symbolically and getting things from it, but making their own. At the end of the day, it is its own sort of languages and it's its own uh, ideas. Another thing that they might have might have helped influence was the uh, when we went to Old St. Peter's Basilica and we had the Propleum and the Propleum and the Propleum you see you know something more simple this facade is a bit more simple and and same thing something similar is happening here so again Romanesque, the Roman Empire coming back to life through Charlemagne and through different representations. Uh, another thing that from the Byzantine is where, you know, it was the Quincunx and the Quincunx, uh, hopefully you remember that, um, but it was this sort of nine grid plan and of multiple domes. Uh, so we see the multiple domes sort of happening. Usually it was five domes, so you start seeing that happen again, bringing back those ideas to uh, to this era. But now we go into something completely different. I wanted to, I started talking about Charlemagne and and the monks, and so in this education and starting to read and the manuscript manuscript and, and creating this new uh, this whole new world. Uh, of, of education that will eventually change everything. So the monasteries became the place, the living headquarters, the living quarters for um, for these monks, for these people who have uh, decided to live away from society, to sort of live a life devoted to to uh, for God, for the advancement of, of of Christianity, for the advancement of also sort of technology. So they spend a lot of time creating new things, studying new things. They become very, very, very smart people. They start creating a lot of things. Uh, so we start seeing this living uh, quarters for them. Uh, usually it has a lot of the, the so this plan, the plan of St. Gaul, uh, is very, very important. You need to remember this because this one becomes sort of the, the master plan or the plan that everyone sort of starts following after. And, and again, what do you think it resembles? Does it remind you something of the Roman Empire? And hopefully uh, you remember something sort of like the plan of Diocletian, this sort of quadrata, this sort of four roads uh, dividing the space. And that's sort of what they use to a certain extent. Again, they do their own version, but they're following that idea. 
But another thing that is very, very important to see is that they add something to this church. And what is that? They add another app at the end. That's something here you see it in this play. You see one, you see another. That's something that we've never seen before. We've only seen churches with one apps. So that's something, again, that it becomes very, very, very easy for you to recognize what kind of plan it is, is that during the Roman as they start really playing with the amount of apps, the amount of transcripts, the amount of chapels, that really starts to explode. And I'll explain a bit more as to why that happens. Uh, Simone, so, so we go to Romanesque architecture, you know, I, I talked about how uh, they go in different wood, they go into this sort of masonry, and it's very, 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 very heavy, little light, and that's sort of what you're seeing here right now. And so some of the plants that become very, very important here, uh, they're sort of still leading the way. Uh, some one of these, uh, some of these, and so what are the, some things that you start seeing? What are some things that you dif differentiate from the Roman architecture? Uh, so let's see. One of the things is here. We see the apse, and you see this sort of like hand, this sort of like fingers coming out, and this is called the radio chapel. What does this mean? Then now you have an apse with little chapels coming out, with little, so they're creating a, a lot, before it was just this apps just sort of plain, but now they're creating this sort of flower, this sort of like rays coming out. And we've talked about how this Latin cross plan is sort of like a head, and, and like a body, and the, the apps becoming the head, and so now it even resembles like wearing a crown, you know, again, going back to the similarities of Jesus, at the cross, wearing a crown, so it's sort of playing with that idea as well again. Uh, but yeah, so things starts to change, starts to really, really change. You have your Latin cross plan, but now you start having these things in the apps. And even look at the last one. Look at the, the plan of son of Hildesheim. And what happens here? You have now one apps. You have two apps. Now you have two transepts. And you have a lot more aisles than you were used to before. So the so Roman S just really gets the idea and just really starts evolving. It just feels like the Latin cross plan evolved and kept on growing and growing and growing and growing, basically. And so so that's something that's very, very interesting. Not only that, but uh, the raising workers during this time, they really like the idea of towers. So when they start putting their own signature, they add here what is called the west work. And the west work is very, very simple. It's kind of facing west. Uh, hence the word west uh, in, the, in their name, but it's basically just two big towers, two big towers, and kind of, and then the entrance in the middle, and that's a, it's an element that we've never seen before that just now starts incorporating into uh, the Romanesque, the Carolinian period. So again, this, if you see a plan, you sort of see this heaviness uh, on the front, you you start know you see this heaviness it's like okay there's probably some towers here so okay this is probably going to be romanesque or you see multiple transepts you see it's like okay or you see this radio apps with you know little chapels radiating um which are for uh different sort of bread legs and and saints uh you start seeing the big difference from before this is uh, a view from inside of, of one of the ones we were watching right now. And so you start seeing the towers that we were mentioning before. We start seeing the different towers. I used to seeing the apps. Uh, and also another thing that, that starts to happen is called transverse arches. And transverse arches just, uh, in a way, they're, they're dividing the space. It's just really, 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 again, playing with the idea of dividing the space. So you see the heaviness, very, 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 very heavy. And then a, a small a small window to provide uh, light. So a um, very small window to provide light, almost almost no light coming in. Uh, through through these windows, it's just the heaviness. You see transverse arches. Another thing that you're going to start noticing is these piers. And piers is not a column. So a column is you know the column, but a piers is is, is sort of a wall with columns uh, encrusted inside. So it's this combination 
walls and columns. So you're seeing this piers going into this transverse arches and small light and and um, and you know and a polychromatic. You see all the different colors, but at the same time, it's very very simple. Also from the outside, not too much. Pretty 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 simple. Because again, during this time, to try to make it again uh, connect to be very simple. Another one of those monasteries is uh, the plan of the Abbey Fontane. And this was uh, the Cistercian, Cistercian Monastery. And this monastery, this sort of group of, of uh, monks uh, that again chosen to live away from society, they kind of got a little mad of other monks, you know, sort of, you know, building chapels or buildings that were really, really big or uh, spending too much money and they were like no we just have to like we don't need a lot of life it's not about that so they sort of created no group and they and uh, and they start this um more austere more simple uh version of 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 the uh, monastery and here you see it you know you start seeing it with this um this sort of landing cross plan but again not too complicated we are missing the finger likes, we're missing the flowers, we're missing, uh, we don't have uh, the, the west work, we don't have the towers. So it's just becoming again a bit more simple. I really, really like though their cloister walk, uh, which is, you know, their courtyard, but all around it they have this colonnade and I think it's an amazing, I've been in some of these and it's an amazing, amazing a work of art to see this this colony to me this so so you start seeing this uh idea um and you see the facade you see the outside and it looks very very simple you know just pretty plain uh just some windows and you know and again during this time uh, most of the idea was to try and keep it very humble very very common and this monks they, they were also called the white monks so they try to use this very clear white sort of stone. You see the transverse arches and the transverse arches, what are interesting about this one is that you start seeing those become a little bit more pointy. And right now it's it's sort of interesting, uh, but we'll see a lot of that more in the Gothic architecture. So it's important to sort of start remembering these elements. Uh, so for when they come later on, you see this piers with this columns, uh, encrusted into this wall, you see the heaviness, and, but it is a bit more simple. You see not a lot of light, just sort of light coming in from what was the entrance. Uh, this monastery, I, I, I wanted to talk about it a little bit because it, it, it talks even more about um, the life of the monks. So the life of the monks, so this was their, their church. Uh, again, you are seeing the Latin cross. But then the transept has, has this rape, this other apses, this sort of chapels, and then this this chapel um, sort of happening again. And but one of the things is is that now you start getting something that is called the choir. So so the monks they they chosen again this life of 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 you know devotion to to God. So they've sort of you know relinquished every you know for for uh, some time this this connection to to the human to human uh, desires human needs and all these things so they don't really spend time with, with people other than themselves and so so in this plan uh, you start seeing how they have an, a public courtyard then they have a courtyard for the monks but also very very important you don't see it too much here but this are uh, the different uh, bedrooms, the houses that they have. And inside they have the room, but then they have another garden inside. They have a garden just for themselves. And what is what is interesting uh, about this garden is that uh, they sort of uh, plant things that have sort of thorns, such as bushes and things like this, that most likely will uh, uh, cut them. And this is, again, so they don't focus on vanity, they don't focus on, they, they're constantly reminded of, of the ephemerity of life, the, the, the fact that life is short, the fact that, you know, what is really, really important, not the tangible, the intangible, not the physical, but the spiritual. Uh, so, so it's a very, very important thing. And so not only that, so then since they're pretty much separated, 
uh, from the world uh, during this time, they're creating a lot of technology. They're, they're creating, a, they're studying, they're creating a lot of great things. But, uh, but when they do, when people, are, and they also create things such as honey and things like this. So if people want to come and they want to buy the honey that they've made, usually there was, you know, the head monk, which is called the, the abbot, uh, would come and contact them. But they were, but the, all the rest of the monks, they were um, in their in their quarters. Uh, so something that happens is that this part becomes the the choir. The choir is basically the part where the monks get to participate in the service for the church, but they're not they're not with everyone else with the lay. Um, the lay just simply means you know all the people that are are not the monks. And so uh, so it's a little interesting thing. So now we come into uh, Pisa. This is this is one. It's pretty interesting because, you know, as you go, you see a lot of the same elements, but they all have their own little take on. So you see this this, this the leaning tower of Pisa, which is a, a campanile, uh, the bell tower, and you see the basilica. And there's a baptistry over here that we don't really see it in this image. But, but this one's also Romanesque. You see the heaviness, you see the facade, pretty simple. And even though it's pretty simple, it, you might argue that it's a bit more complex. And why do you think it was complex? The reason why this happened is because uh, Pisa is actually uh, a naval place. It's connected to the water, so they have a lot of ships. So they're, they're traveling different places. And so we just came from Islamic architecture. And Islamic architecture is known for all these kinds of patterns, for all these kinds of geometry, this repetition. And so they're, they're probably learning all of these things and they probably liked it. So they place that in their facade. You see the repetition of these columns. But what's really, really interesting is that, um, that these columns are, you can't really walk through here. So it's in a way it's 3D but at the same time it's 2D. So it is still very flat. So all of these, these facades during this time are very, very flat, just, just very showing the material, just a big piece of stone, basically. Uh, so here you see the, the Tilling Tower Pisa, basically it just started to fall um, almost since it began the construction. Eventually they kept on constructing and they kept on falling. Now they've reinforced it and they say it's gonna be able to hold on um, for at least 100 years if no earthquakes happen. So so that's pretty good. Uh, here's an image of me, again, many, 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 many years ago in front of the Tower of Pisa. Uh, but something that I was very, very interested, that I enjoyed, I already told you uh, some some of the, the trip, of the, the, the tip of the day if you're ever going to travel here, is don't book, a, don't book uh, a stay here for a week, five days or something. Just stay for a day, you know, the city's pretty, pretty small, not a lot to do. And so we made the mistake, I think I've already mentioned this, but I made the mistake of staying there a couple of days. So we were pretty bored, you know, after seeing everything. I mean, it's a really, really, really nice, beautiful city, but, you know, pretty small. So um, uh, the point is we spent a couple of days and there was a night that uh, we we stayed in a hotel pretty close by, really, really walking distance. And we came here in front of the tower and here's this floor. And we just lay down almost like a midnight, you know, very pretty late. And just a couple of friends, we were just laying down. And it was this amazing, surreal experience of laying down, seeing the Leaning Tower of Pisa, watching the stars, hearing some music in the background in this beautiful, peaceful city in Italy. And it was an amazing, amazing experience. And it was super safe. I don't, so I really encourage you to do that. I don't know if things have changed and they do allow people to do that nowadays, but at the time they did let us do that. So it was a really, really uh, great experience, really, really surreal to the point. Uh, so I'll probably include in uh, as a, a bonus question, what did I do in the Leaning Tower of Pisa? And the answer is going to be lay down and watch the stars or something like that. So you'll get extra credits just for listening to this uh, lecture. So that's my tip of the day. Go uh, stay a day or if you do stay two days, go lay down and watch the stars. It's a really cool experience. So now we uh, we go we went from one thing. So the number one thing that we we've learned from this that's very different was the monasteries. So the monasteries is you know 
this sort of complex for silica with you know quarters for living quarters uh, yeah, so the dining hall there's there's all these things happening there but not only do we have people that are devoted to living in a place for god for christianity but we also have people who are traveling uh from uh uh, what, it, what they're called pilgrimage. So pilgrimage is uh, is basically a trip that they take from from visiting different churches, and, and so uh, hopefully you know this by now. And I think I've mentioned it. And if not, I'll mention it right now. But every church has some sort of um, is dedicated to someone. Is dedicated to to Mary, to John, to Peter, and and hopefully you've noticed that you know the, the Peter of Saint Ames, or, or Saint uh, Saint Saint uh, Peter. You know, there's always some sort of name behind it, and every and not only do they have the name, but it has some sort of relic, something that belonged to them, either something literally from their body, or maybe even something that they wore. You know, a, a piece of cloth, a piece of the robe or something. And, and so the most famous ones are the ones that some miracle occurred. So people, um, you know, if a miracle occurred in this church, that church really, really becomes extremely popular and it becomes a pilgrim site because uh, people want to visit your church from all over the world. So, uh, so that is one of the biggest reasons why the basilica, the churches start really, really, really changing because now you have this influx of people traveling from all over to your basilica. So what does that mean? You need a lot more space. And not only do you need more space, but they're coming to, to visit these altars. They're, they're coming to, to, to be with this uh, uh, with the saints. And so, so now the churches, you, again, you get your basic um cross plan uh, latin cross plan but now you get a lot more space it's ambulatory space but now they create again we see this uh radio chapels we see these radio chapels that are happening here which are most likely will have some sort of saint so now the people that are traveling in their pilgrimage they can walk around visit all the different saints and now they have a lot more space to walk around and now at this time is that we really, really see the idea of the radio radio apps uh, happening in its full force. You know, before it was sort of a bit awkward, you know, square-like, but now, you know, it's really, really taking shape. It's kind of becoming a norm or something very, like a standard. And so again, the West works, we see the West works happening again. Uh, not only that, but we see the choir. We talked about the choir, what was the choir? Uh, it was a place reserved for the monks. And, and we also start seeing um, something that is called the crossing. So that's something that's also very, very important. The crossing is this uh, sort of what it says. It's the crossing between the nave and the tra transit. And so this, uh, this crossing becomes a big um, organizational organizational uh uh, grid. So what that means is that um, what that means is that the crossing becomes sort of the grid. So this becomes the, the main square, and then the the bays or the spaces in between sort of become half of it. So here you see that's uh, half of it of 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 uh, of what the main one. And then the aisles you get one for it. So you start seeing all of these. Uh, following a, a grid coming from the, the 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 crossing, and not only in the crossing, but in the crossing sometimes you see that on the outside there's a huge tower, or there's a big dome, or there's something. So the crossing becomes a big um, sort of symbolic, very uh, important place uh, to to really really um, represent something. So here we see the transverse arches sort of creating the space. See the aisles. We see the uh, the gallery, the groin vault um, right here that I saw represented by axes. So here you see the axes. So wherever you see the X representing the groin vault, and so you start seeing this, this this church really creating a place for pilgrimage. And so we've talked about pilgrimage. Um, pilgrimages uh, they start going to different places. One of the places the most important is San Costello. And, and so, um, and this the Sancostello Church is one of the most famous ones. Um, 
and uh, you know many people saying that there's a lot of miracles happening there's a lot of people start going there but so this this church is uh, Costello is kind of built on this uh, end sort of at the end and and in order to get there you go through different vias and the different vias they have different churches along the, the path. So before you get to the, the main one, or not the main one, but one of the most important ones, you kind of visit this minor ones are a bit more or less, but it's this whole journey that takes them, uh, you know, a uh, pretty long process. And they carry this, the seashells, this representation of the pilgrimage. And the reason is because uh, the way, you know, they're trying to deconnect, they're trying to connect more to the spiritual, less to the human, more to the tangible, intangible, um, and less, uh, less of the tangible. And so they carry the seashell originally as a way of uh, their only means of survival. So that's what they would use to, to you know, ask people for money in the streets. That's what they would use to as a plate for when they would eat. That's what they would use for water. So it was to become sort of they can uh, originally they could only travel with that and a stick so it was sort of this 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 hard process you know very 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 spiritually uh fulfilling experience and so this is some of the churches that you might see on on some of the vias if you ever do choose to kind of uh, visit some of these uh one of this is a saying for uh tempanum again we start seeing the heaviness, we start seeing very few light, we start seeing the tower likes. You know, again, this is very like, it seems more like, you know, tower is something that the kid can draw. Pretty, pretty simple. Uh, again, the facade, not too exaggerated, just pretty, pretty plain. Uh, so this is the Romanesque. But something that is interesting is uh, here you do see this, this tympanum, which is this sort of, uh, it's uh, it's sort of a, a half circle, um, with um, encrypted with all these different images. And here is the the, the judge, the last judgment. You see hell, you see heaven, and and the reason why this is important again is you start seeing these images, sort of Egyptian, very lifeless. It's very hierarchical. You see the Jesus at the center. You see Jesus is bigger than everyone else. So it's very, very hierarchical. But at the same time, it's nothing like we would have seen at the Greek, nothing like we would have seen at the Roman during the time. It's, it's really more about the spiritual story, about the story that it's trying to tell rather than the naturalistic and to the express art. So it looks a bit primitive or a bit less and uh, not too artistic, but but this is, you know, again, an, an easy way to remember which one, which one is this. Uh, so we're almost done. So now let's sort of uh, recapulate, let's just sort of go over to all the terms that we've learned. And so and hopefully this is sort of makes sense. And so the Latin cross plan, we know this one. It's, you know, what we've kind of been used to. The aisle, we've seen that. Now it's a bit bigger, a bit more space. Uh, with the X, X marking the groin bolt. We see the nave again. We've seen that sort of in before. So, so far, so good. Um, uh, but now we see the, 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 the uh, but also the transept, which is, you know, here. We've seen them before. Uh, but now we go to the chapel, the radiating. And again, these are this chapel this radiating sort of flower finger cross like crown sort of in the head just creating that sort of side chapels uh we see the west work which is these towers you know you see that this sort of towers happy um also uh the, the choir what was the choir the choir is here the choir again it was for the monks a special place that they can only be so they can be in a way separate from everyone else the crypt, is, the crypt is usually in the apse, but it's a basement. So it's usually uh, a basement, and they would, it was where usually they would bury someone very important for the to the church. And also, they would sometimes they would do have uh, service there, so it kind of have service the double function. Uh, the apse we mentioned the apse before. Uh, the crossing, I've talked about the crossing, and sort of here you see this tower is in the crossing. 
And I talked about the organizational effect of the crossing, how, you know, the square is now this device to this and to this. So said it has a bigger thing. The pier, we talked about the pier, is sort of this wall with, you know, columns encrusted in it. And we saw bays and bases, you know, from, from, uh, from here to here, from different spaces, the middle or the space created in between is the base. So this is sort of how you, you say those oh, 20, 20 base or go to the third bay. Um, so this is, uh, again, one of the churches that you'll see in, in the, on the pilgrimage road, which is Saint Sydney in France. And uh, again, it's, it's, again, it's a pilgrimage church. So again, you'll see the, the, um, the, uh, this, this chapel is coming out. You see the, the, the crossings tower. You see again the, 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 the chapel is coming out. Uh, you see, you know, this very wide nave with a lot of aisles with a lot, probably another you know, chapels coming out here. So, so again, it becomes a very, very important uh, pilgrim shop. So this is a, a view from the inside. You know, we talked about the groin bowls, which are marked with the axes on the plan. We talked about the compound piers, which is, you know, a wall within a pier column. Uh, we talked about the uh, the base and all of this. So this is sort of a view from inside to the transverse arches. Uh, let's see. And we'll just end uh, with Norman architecture. I won't talk too much. It's only going to be this image. But what I want you to really uh, see is something that I didn't mention too much. But it's, it's uh, something else that they start adding is this rose window. And I didn't mention it before, but it, you, if you go back, you probably see it in other build in other images. So you see it here, you know, this rose window. And this rose window is created as a symbol for Virgin Mary. So the Virgin Mary is very, very important to them, um, maternal figure. And, and so this, this, uh, uh, this representation of the beauty of Mary gets encapsulated in the rose window. So this rose window that we just saw versus this one, this one's really, you can start seeing more the idea of the rose window and this one's a lot prettier. Uh, again, but uh, so here, but you, and you'll see this later on in the Gothic architecture. And that's the, one of the reasons why I really didn't want to spend too much in Roman architecture, Norman architecture, sorry. Um, but just the fact that you, you are seeing the birth of, of, of the Gothic architecture that we'll be able to see later on. So it's a very kind of easy segue. So in conclusion, what are the final thoughts? What do you think? So Charlemagne really, really tried to bring the Roman Empire and he kind of created what people say is a fall spring of classical revivalism. So he, many people say that he didn't really accomplish this uh, the same level, but uh, others argue that he did, really wasn't. He was just trying to do his own thing, but he did. He really did a big, big thing. Uh, the monasteries become a big place for you know to create new things and to really control the countryside. Uh, we talked a little bit about the Vikings and how they really, really worked with wood and creating really amazing staves. Staves we talked about as the vertical uh, wood piles. And then uh, even though, uh, you know, wood is an amazing form of to create architecture, it's not really fireproof. So the idea of uh, Romanesque um, really, really started to use masonry and stone and thus uh, giving it the heaviness and the, the, this feeling of, uh, of heaviness that you see throughout the whole Romanesque architecture. Uh, the, the, the mason workers, um, which I think I mentioned, I'm not sure if I mentioned, but uh, mason workers are, you know, now they get to travel from different cities. So mason workers are basically architects. They're elevated to, you know, that they're designed and they build. And and not only that, so so, uh, so they're designers and they're also builders. And so that's, uh, so the Romanus architecture is spreading all over in different countries. And one of the main reasons it spreads is because of the mason workers, because mason workers, they're not bound to a place. They're, they're, they can travel. So they, they create an amazing architecture. And now someone likes them and then 
they kind of get paid and they travel to different places. So, so, uh, so the idea of Mason works is a very, very, uh, maybe you've heard the term Freemason and Freemason is just that they were free to move around place to place. Um, and last, and so, and so these people, they really, really like the idea of towers, which they introduced to us a new, uh, the new concept of West work. So they introduced, there's a, a lot of new concepts happening in this time. One of the big ones was West work. And Naples and churches eventually took three dimensionally in the form. And so the, the last thing I just want to end is with, you know, the idea of Romanesque and Gothic. That's a big question that many people are asking. And, you know, a lot of people are always comparing. Uh, but I do want to, I do think, you know, my perspective is that, you know, um, the Romanesque, they, they did extraordinary things with, uh, and they were in a way just really experimenting with the heavy materials. It did turn out to be very, a little bit dark, and it seems a bit immature, you know, very, very uh, not to progress. But uh, they were in a way very, very experimenting with all these exploiting the the weight and the shadow and the massiveness of the stone material and really just exploiting it to as much as they can so i think um, um i wouldn't compare and say that one is better than the other but i do want to uh, wanted to say that and also that um you know you'll you'll see a lot of elements uh flowing into uh what uh, the gothic really becomes so I'm going to end really quickly with uh, the review. I have a, a, a review of the of some of the questions that are most likely going to be on the um, on the test. So let's let's start with that. Let's see, if it's sharing. Okay, here we go. Um, so so yeah, let's start from the beginning. So a couple of questions. So this one. Um, just sort of look into the different plant. What are the different areas? You know, so we have a refectory. This is a place where they sort of eat, a meeting place. Uh, we said the, the chapter house, which is a dormitory. We have the connected sort of transept. We uh, we talked about this courtyard uh, with this cloister. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, the cellar. So just look at this image. And it's just trying to remember. Um, what is the monastery? What are the things happening there? So I just left the question mark. This one for sure will be on the test and the final exam. And it's important that you know all these elements. So you're going to do one of those questions that, that match the things with, with the things next to each other. Um, but it's important, you know, I, I talked mostly about the state because it's really what this is called. But uh, there's other elements that are really, really important. So just look into that. So what are the elements? Pilgrimage, what is it? We talked about it a little bit, so I just want you to, you know, just know, have a, have a concept of what is that. Uh, what is this church? Something that I want you to know that it's, it's during this class, you might not remember every single name. You might not remember every single date. You might not even remember every single city that they're from. But something that I do want you to get out is what is the name, what is the, uh, the style? And so you, you sort of see it and it's like, oh, this is Romanesque, oh, this is early Christian, oh, this is Gothic, oh, this is Egyptian. Some are easier than others to, to recognize, but I do want you to recognize them. And so this is the question mainly is, what is the style? And I mean, it's pretty obvious here because we just covered it, uh, but when you do have the final and you'll have, you know, other images kind of popping up it might get a little bit more confusing. So just try to remember. So again, what is this style, and what and what is uh, uh, the name? So this is pretty pretty. I think probably one of the most easiest because the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and but just don't get confused. This is Romanesque, um, and again, what is this? Again, idea of Romanesque. So the period of Western European history for the decline of Rome till the beginning of the Renaissance is known as, I'll give you this one, and it's called the Medieval Period or the Middle Ages. Leaning Tower Pisa is part of the Pisa Cathedral Complex. What was the purpose of that building? I mentioned it very, very quickly, but just look up what was the actual purpose of that. 
Uh, this one, uh, again, uh, didn't mention too much, but um, I didn't mention the name. So what is this? What is the name of this one? Uh, medical advancements and knowledge, medieval advancements, sorry, and knowledge and architecture was achieved in part through the works of priests and monks. So is this true or false? And I, I mentioned this before, uh, that there, that there was a lot of improvements happening as they were really pursuing education and all these things. What are the most uh, churches along the pilgrimage road in France and Spain? So we talked about these roads, which are called the pilgrimage churches, and what style are they? You know, what, what, again, pretty simple. Why Romanesque buildings have certain affinity? So, what is their affinity? They mostly use semicircle or Roman church. So, again, what is this? I didn't mention this building in the presentation. It is in the book, but it's going to be in the test. I didn't mention it. Um, but what, what style is this? Again, since we just covered the book, it's easy, but I want you to see it and understand it, you know, and the fact that it looks very, very plain, almost like a facade, almost like paper thin. It's, again, the idea that Romanesque was just keeping things very, very simple. So this was Minato Monte. Uh, this is the name of the church. The name is not too important. It's more about what is it, um, the style. So the Carolinian buildings are based in the big part of Roman, early Christian, Byzantine. So... Is it true or false? So it's, uh, just kind of think of that. So, all right. Uh, thank you so much for, for spending time. For, for you. We are so close to finishing. So just keep it up, work on the assignments. You've got this. Any questions, just let me know. Thank you and have a good week.